Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Nawaitu wa ta'allamu wa ta'alim wa tazakara wa tazkir wa annafa' wa l'antifa' wa l'ifadata wa l'istifada wa l'hathala tamasiki bi kitabi la wa sunati rasulihi wa du'a ila al-huda wa dalalata ala al-khayr ibtigha wa chila wa mardati wa qurbi wa thwabi subhanahu wa ta'ala Rabbi yashrah li sadri wa yasir li amri wa ahlul uqtatan min lisani yafquhu qawli Allahumma sali ala sayyidina muhammad al-miftahi bab rahmatillah عدد ما في علم الله الصلاة والسلام دائما بدوام موكلا وعلى آله ومن ولا Again I greet you Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah that Allah has allowed us to gather in his remembrance and be amongst the people that gather to remember him and many people are gathering to forget Alhamdulillah we gather to remember so inshallah, today, this evening begins a series, this is really to serve as an introduction to a book called The Lives of Man by Imam al-Haddad, may Allah be pleased with him. And inshallah, in what follows in remaining weeks, we will explore this book deeply. And this book is beautiful because um, it gives you a map of existence. Not only this life, and not only the life to come, but the life that preceded. In a certain sense, we as human beings, we, we kind of, this life is like in the middle of the book somewhere. But you know, if you don't read the first chapters or the last chapters, you can't really understand. You just start in the middle. It the, the doesn't begin at birth in this life, in other words. As uh, Brother Ramis mention an analogy. It's like we all woke up on a train going somewhere and it's like where am I going? How did I get here? And it's even like who am I? <laughs> what is this body I'm in? And this is the affair. May Allah guide us to know where we're going. So where are you going? Allah says in the Quran. So, inshallah, we'll speak a little bit about this book, which is of the utmost importance because it speaks about where we're from and where we, we're going, inshallah. Um, and who is, whoever was here last week, our brother Ramis also shared very beautifully reflections on five fundamental questions. Does anybody remember these five questions? Did you do your homework? Alhamdulillah. I'll, re I'll remind you, inshallah, if I remember them. Nah. But these are really profound because in preparing to think about this book, I was reflecting on that this is the exact intention that Imam al-Haddad had when he wrote this book. And the subtitle of this book is A Guide to the Human States Before Life, In the World, and After Death. So... The first thing, the first question when you wake up on the train is, what is this? Or where am I? Right. This is a fundamental question and when philosophers talk about this, they say this question falls under the rubric of ontology or also cosmology. In other words, the study of existence or the study of the cosmos. The second question is, how do I know what I know? And this happens when you start to ask those questions, right? Children, why, why, why? They're asking these questions. How do I know what I know? And how do I know that I truly know it? This is, philosophers call it epistemology. Episteme, which means knowledge. So it's the study of knowing of how you know what you know. Even more primary than that is the question, what am I? Who am I? What am I? What sort of thing am I? What does it mean to be a human being? Why am I this point of consciousness that is placed in this strange body 
that allows me to breathe this earth's atmosphere. What does that mean? And that also opens to questions of, we could say ontology, because what does it mean to be existence? But also psychology, which means the study of the soul. Psyche means soul. Or anthropology, the study of the human being, the anthropo. And that then will lead to the fourth question, which is, what is my happiness? What is my purpose? In other words, what should I be doing here? Like, why? What am I here for? And, of course, for us, that has to do with ultimate happiness, not just fleeting happiness. And that's soteriology, which is the study of sa'ada. In our tradition, it's called sa'ada, which is like true, eternal happiness. Or you could say salvation. And that's related to the fifth question, which is, where am I going? In, in other words, what happens after you die? How does this end? This is called the ma'ad, the return in our tradition. And the philosophers call it eschatology. In a certain sense, these are the five fundamental questions. And as our brother Ramis mentioned really beautifully last week, that in a certain sense, how you answer these defines every aspect of your life. And... Everyone, even if they haven't really formulated their thoughts, is operating at least on a half-formulated response to these questions. Every action, every even intention that you have grows out of your answers to these questions. And primarily, what the prophets do is answer these questions. This is what they came to do. And it's really interesting because now people in our age, they say like, what's it all about? No one knows, <laughs> right? You can't know. Are you sure? Are you sure no one knows? Right? Have you at least read the books of the great sages and saints and prophets who at least said that they had some intimations or knowledge of this realm? It's the most irresponsible thing you could do to not have read exhaustively this one thing. Right? But this is, uh, this is our condition, is that people shy away even, often, from these questions. So may Allah give us clarity on these questions. And Imam al-Haddad, may Allah bless him, he sought to give us clarity on these questions in this book. La ilaha illallah. Now, of course, we know that our deen has multiple dimensions. When the angel Gabriel came in the form of a man to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in what is called the Umm al-Hadith, the, the mother of hadith, right? Ummah Sunnah, because of its comprehensiveness, this hadith. And it came at the very end of the Prophet's life, a few months before he passed away, وسلم, that Jibreel came to the Prophet وسلم, while he was sitting amongst his companions, and his clothing was exceedingly white, and his hair was exceedingly black, and he had no marks of travel. We've all heard the narration. And he asked the Prophet Sallallahu a question. He sat intimately with him, knee to knee. And he placed his hands on his thighs. And the scholars debate, does it mean he put his hands on his own thighs or the Prophet's thighs? But in any case, it was knee to knee and an extremely intimate. The way you would sit with your intimate, not like someone that you didn't know. And this is narrated by uh, Sayyidina Omar and others. And they remarked, Observing like this is not how we've seen anyone behave with the Prophet And so he asked him What is Islam? What is Iman? What is Ihsan? And then he said Mata sa'a, when is the hour? And then he asked what are its signs? These were the questions And this establishes, it's called the mother of the Sunnah Because it establishes ultimately 
a framework, a paradigm for understanding the whole tradition, the whole deen, the whole sunnah, the whole way of life. And without going too deep into that for the purpose of our conversation, the Prophet ﷺ listed the five pillars in answer to the question of what is Islam. And Jibril said, Sadaqt, like, you have spoken correct. He said correct, essentially. And Sayyidina Omar remarked, he said, we found it strange that he would ask the Prophet and then say correct, as if he was the teacher of the Prophet. We'd never heard anyone speak like that. Because they, would, and he, they were in such awe of the Prophet, وسلم, that they couldn't imagine someone speaking to him like a pupil. But of course, Sayyidina Jibreel was doing this for them present. And so then when he, was at, he asked, what is Iman? He gave the articles of faith to believe in God, to believe in the angels, the books, Yom Qiyamah, Qadr, and uh, the garden and the fire. And then he asked, What is Ihsan? And he answered, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Ta'budullah ka anna ka tarahu fa in lam takun tara in nahu yarak. That to worship Allah is if you see him, or to devote yourself to Allah is if you see him, and if you do not see him, he is seeing you. And to be aware of that. And then he got into the end of time and he mentioned its signs. And when he asked, when is the end of time? The Prophet ﷺ said, the one being asked knows no better than the one asking. And then he said, what are its signs? And he spoke وسلم, about a number of the signs, which we won't get into right now. That's for another day. But what's really important to understand is this establishes that our deen is dimensions. Often, people think that Islam is just, in this schema, is just Islam, right, with a lowercase i, as in the dimension of practice. Right, so our scholars have, have said, and the science of fiqh was extrapolated to look at the right action in the world, how to worship Allah, how to interact with each other. No. But Iman was then right understanding or right vision essentially about the nature of the world and then ihsan is right state of being right awareness so, so these are the dimensions and we could speak more of that but suffice it to say that a book like this is focused on the dimension of iman primarily because iman is telling us about the nature of the world I and mean, what we are doing here where we are where we are and the Prophet ﷺ gave us a number of analogies when he talked about this world. One was that he said, this world is a dream. This world is a dream. And when you die, you wake up. So the Prophet ﷺ is indicating to us that this life is a dream. He also said, ﷺ, Die before you die. <laughs> right? And there are those that wake up before they wake up. One of my favorite analogies, and those that know me know I like to go back to this, and I tell the story that when I first heard this, I was in seventh grade. And uh, I was thinking about, actually, because our brother, one of the young brothers in our community, he's in, uh, actually, he's in eighth grade now. But because of the pandemic, he missed sixth and seventh grade. He told me that. He didn't have sixth or seventh grade. And that amazed me because I recalled how important those years were in my life, like, as far as, like, formation of identity and everything. And so to not have those years, just have them taken away, from, I couldn't imagine it. And if that would have happened, I wouldn't have heard this one thing that my teacher told me in seventh grade that I never forgot. And that was Plato's allegory of the cave. It's one of the only things I remember from seventh grade. But it's the only thing I needed to remember. <laughs> Alas. Because it's, it formed me and it informed me. And the allegory, without going into all the details, is really profound and sets up an understanding of the nature of this world. And that is that in the allegory, there's a group of people that are in a cave and they're staring at the wall of the cave. 
and they're yoked, so they can't turn their heads, and they're in chains, so they can't get up. So all they see are the shadows on the back wall of the cave, but because they've never seen anything but that, for them, that is reality itself. That is reality itself. And in the allegory, one man finds himself all of a sudden freed of his change and free of his yoke, and he's able to turn his head, and he's able to walk around. And when he walks around, he sees that there's a wall, and he sees that there's um, a fire in the, behind. And he sees that the shadows are actually cast by this fire. Right? The shadows are dancing from these forms that are in front of the fire. And so he starts to investigate, but then he realizes that behind the fire, there's actually like a, <laughs> there's stairs. And there's like a bright light, like this one in my eyes. <laughs> and so he starts to go closer, and each step up that he goes, it's so bright, and he's been in utter darkness his whole life, such that it actually pains him to draw closer to the light. And so he has to stop. It, it disorients him. He has to stop and allow himself to adjust each step up. And each step it gets more bright and more bright and more bright until he takes a step into the light itself. And it's like ecstatic and painful and discombobulating. And all of a sudden his eyes adjust and he realizes he's just stepped out of a cave. <laughs> he's in the world. He sees the sky and the clouds and the birds and all these things. And he explores for some time and sees this world infinitely more vast, infinitely more beautiful than what he thought. He thought the whole world was shadows, nothing but shadows. And now he's seeing all of this. And he's in a state of awe and ecstasy. And after exploring this world for some time, what do you think he did? What would you want to do? He wanted to tell his people in the cave. They have to know about this. And so he ran back into the cave and he said, Listen, behind you there's a fire. The fire is casting shadows on the cave wall. Behind the fire there is a light and there are steps that you can ascend. If you ascend, it will get brighter and brighter until you enter into the light and come through the light into a world. Out there, there is a sky that is infinitely more vast. There are colors. There are animals and birds and various species. And he kept going. And at the end of it, what do you think they said to him? And he, what are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? Because in a certain sense, on one level, you almost can't blame them. Because they don't really even have a reference point for what he's saying. It's so far beyond what they've experienced. And Plato then says something very interesting, that he says, because he's so insistent, like, no, I'm not lying. It's real. You have to understand me. He says, at a certain point, they go from disbelieving in him to hating him. To hating him. Because what he's saying is undermining their very assumptions, the bedrock of their worldview. He is upsetting their answers to the five questions, right? He's giving them new information that will make them rethink the whole affair. And anyone who has ever been through a, what they call now an existential crisis, or had their worldview shattered for whatever reason or ever experience, you know that it's more painful than any physical pain. Because you're literally like a planet out of orbit, as our brother said. You're literally in complete chaos. There's no reference point. Where is up? Where is down? There's no qibla. There's no compass. And for some reason, even though I wasn't a very good student, in seventh grade, when I heard that, I was like, that's real. We're in the cave. I just intuited, like, this is it. We're in the cave, and there's a way out. And that somehow led me, years later, to read 
the various world's wisdom traditions, especially because I wasn't born into a family that had a structured religion, so I didn't have the answers. So I had to seek them for myself. And when I studied Islam especially, it became clear to me that, oh, all the prophets, they're the ones who got out of the cave. And they came back to tell their people. In fact, when I read Surah Yasin, the same image of those that disbelieve, they're yoked. <laughs> they're yoked. Ajeeb. And, Ya Layta Qawmi, you know, when, when the, the, the one who comes and he says, if my people only knew. You know, so this is the affair. And what happens with all the prophets, almost all the prophets, what do their people do? Reject them, hate them, oppose them, want to kill them, try to kill them. How many assassination attempts were, were there on the life of the Prophet ﷺ? I mean, essentially, the majority of the seerah was the Meccans trying to kill the Prophet ﷺ. I mean, this is the affair. La ilaha illallah. And so, And in pre-modern societies that were based on revolution, with, uh, that were based on revelation without exception, everything in the society conspired to remind people about the fleeting nature of the world and the true purpose of this world, which was to leave the cave. Right? So all the architecture, all the artwork, the calligraphy in our tradition or the the iconography and other traditions, right? all of the art and the song and even the tapestries and the clothing, everything was, to, was conspiring to remind you about what this is all about. And of course we're in a different world than that now, aren't we? That everything in our modern cities is conspiring that we forget. Everything is conspiring that you forget. It wasn't only the Islamic civilization. If anyone's been to Europe, for instance, let alone other places, and you go to old cathedrals, La ilaha illallah. These people believed in God. And, you know, when I was, I went to Florence. If anyone's been to Florence, they have the Domo. You know, it's the great dome, the great cathedral. And uh, Florence is an amazing city. It was like the Fez of Europe. It was this medieval city that's really well preserved. In any case, on the dome is like this profoundly epic scene painted. It's massive. It's like hundreds and hundreds of figures. And it's Yom Okiyama. And there's literally angels pulling people upward and demons pulling people down and people going through all these different states. And I looked up, like for hours, I just looked at that. It was like being on psychedelics it really was like like i lost all track of time and i just I thought of like medieval peasants <laughs> like sitting there every week like you know and that was the world they lived in they lived with presence and awareness of that and now everything in our society is encouraging us to be heedless from the preface i'm not going to read the whole preface but our beloved teacher, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Rad, who wrote the preface, he has a passage that I think is really profound. And he's talking about how Muslims, mashallah, are still in a state of remembrance of the fleeting nature of this world. And then he says that modern man, by contrast, has been programmed to dismiss the traditional belief, belief in an immortal soul as mythic or even bizarre. One does not have to be a believer to know that the consequences of this new dogma have been appalling. If there is no judgment and hence no authentic ground of justice in the world, then morality, as secular philosophers have appreciated, is a myth. And then he goes on to say, No culture since Adam has lived in deeper ignorance 
of what man truly is, a symmetrical, noble form enshrining a soul, an organ capable of tr such translucence that it can, when the senses and passions which distract it are stilled, form a window onto that reality, al-haq, of which this world offers no more than a distorted reflection. For those human beings who have been granted this state of awakening, the real world which they survey is truer than anything they had known here below. All of us will see the real world, the akhirah, at death. But only the prophets fully know of it before they die and hence can warn their contemporaries. The revelations which God gives them and which they give to mankind are thus the only sources of meaning and understanding which will ever be available. To hold to them is to cling to a rope let down from God, while to let go is to fall ineluctably into chaos. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So in a certain sense, what is Iman? Iman is to have secure conviction. It's not just like blind faith. La. It's secure conviction that this world is not all there is. That this world is not all there is. And in essence, the Prophet ﷺ said that Iman is a light that is cast into the heart. And there's many levels. It's not just a light that's like on or off it's light that increases or decreases and we all know because we go through states of like we're locked in maybe during Ramadan and others and then other times we feel more of a difficulty even the Sahaba were like that they said when we're with you Ya Rasulullah it's like <laughs> Yaqeen absolute certainty sometimes we go amongst our families and our households and all these things we we decrease and the Prophet some said, he just smiled, he said, if you were like that all the time, you would be greeting angels in the streets, you'd be witnessing the unseen. Like, <laughs> not everyone can be like that, right? May Allah increase us in Iman. So, but what are our sources of knowledge? This is really important, and I don't want to go into a whole, although it's important, Right to think about the modern world and the postmodern world, because a lot of our differences with the modern and postmodern world comes down to just epistemology. What are our sources of knowledge? Because primarily both of them de deny wahi, they deny revelation. That's it. You either accept or you don't. I mean, it comes down to that ultimately. You either accept the prophets or not. Right. Now we also accept intellect as a sacred faculty, a sacred faculty. And this is a gift from Allah, and it can be inspired, and it's sacred. And that's why, right, the maqasid of the sharia, the sharia is not just rules, but there are actually underlying principles which, from which all the rules are derived. And their preservation, preservation of life, preservation of Deen, way of life, spiritual, spirituality, preservation of intellect, right? Preservation of uh, a number of other things. But intellect is one of them. This is why we can't drink alcohol. <laughs> this is why. Because it harms your intellect. It takes away your intellect. That's why, you know, in popular culture, <laughs> right? People wake up the morning after they've been drinking. What did I do? Oh my God, what did I text to my ex? Right? Like they hadn't, th their intellect was taken away from them. They chose to have their intellect taken away. And, and so this is impermissible because the intellect is sacred. It's sacred. And it's not just the rational faculty, but the intellect itself is a faculty of the heart that can be in awakened and inspired. Now, I'm going to say a little bit about this book and I'll say inshallah a little bit about Imam al-Haddad himself but first I wanted to just explore a little bit about this analogy of the dream uh, that the Prophet sallallahu gave us and I'll just list quickly you know the five lives essentially uh, I'll say a few words about what came before 
Now, the Qur'an speaks about a lot about what comes after this world. But the Qur'an also speaks about what precedes this world. And, inshallah, next week we're going to focus on that. We're going to talk about the first life, the primordial realms. The primordial realm, which is called the world of the spirits, or the world of the covenant, or the, the, the world of alest, which alludes to the covenant. And there's a lot that could be said, but again, we'll leave that for next week. But the key is that we were created as spirits, arwah, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that realm. And that is our true identity, is spirit. And we were in the Divine Presence witnessing Allah. That's where we are from. وَنَفَقْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ And Allah says, and I blew into him, into him, which means you, all of us. From my ruh, Allah attributes the ruh to himself. And the Quran also says, يعني, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنَ الْرُوحِ They ask you about the ruh, say that <laughs> we've only been given knowledge but a little. يعني, the ruh is something that, what can you say about it? This is our true nature. Its home is the Divine Presence. It, your spirit, your spirit, which is who you are, has seen Allah. For yani, millennia, time out of time. Infinitely longer than your life on this world. That's who you are. And you have heard the Divine Address. You have witnessed Allah. You have made tawaf around the throne of Allah. For yani, what we would say thousands and thousands and thousands of years, even these terms are symbols for how long it really was. And deep down inside, you remember. Even if you don't remember, you remember. You remember. <laughs> this is what dhikr is. Why is everything dhikr? Why is the Prophet some called dhikr? Why is the Quran called dhikr? Why is everything about dhikr in our deen? Remember what? It's remember this. In other words, remember that you've been out of the cave. <laughs> remember that you're sleeping. You're in a dream. But one thing that's amazing about a dreamer is that the dreamer never actually leaves the place that they fell asleep. Your spirit has never left the Divine Presence. It can never leave the Divine Presence. Even if you yourself don't have access to your spirit. And what this whole deen is about is how to access your spirit. The only thing that veils you from you is you. <coughs> your nafs. And we'll get into this when we talk about the dunya, the second week after next, right? The lower world. The whole path. Islam, Iman, Ihsan, Sharia, Tariqah, Haqiqah. It is to realize and to remember and to recall your true self. And it is possible. And there are people, a lot of people, <laughs> that do it. That have done it and that do it now. And maybe some of them are amongst us. May Allah always keep us with the awliya. And the Prophet ﷺ told us this. When he said in Sahih and uh, Muslim and Bukhari, a, a hadith, the meaning of which, when Allah said, speaking about wilaya, sainthood, that I oppose whoever opposes my wali. And my servant draws near by what I have made obligatory and continues to draw near by extra acts of devotion, nawafil, hatta uhibu, until I love them. And when I love them, I am the seeing with which they see, the hearing with which they hear, the hand with which they grasp, the foot with which they walk. La ilaha illallah. May Allah allow us to experience this. And so I wanted to explore an analogy because we're modern people, and especially we have some young people, and I think it's really helpful. Um, to think about things in this way, although <laughs> all analogies have shortcomings. But I think this analogy is actually incredibly profound. The Prophet ﷺ was talking to his Sahaba that were any, Bedouin, right, desert people, 
from 1400 years ago and they did not have cell phones they did not have live streaming they did not have microphones to amplify their voices and many of the things and one thing they did not have is virtual reality has anybody experienced virtual reality oculus rift or whatever the newest one i don't know our sister camila allah bless her who is here she brought <laughs> I don't know what, which one it is, but some virtual reality headset to this Wasit meeting, actually. And after the meeting, I put it on. And, La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. But it was not the first time. And this is like how you know, Meta <laughs> Sa'a. When is the hour? We're in the end of times. The first time I used virtual reality, I was in Konya, the city of Maulana Rumi, where he's buried, a sacred city in, in, in uh, modern-day Turkey, Anatolia. And we were visiting the sacred places there with, with a group of people. And my SIM card, I couldn't use my phone. I had to call home. You know. So I went into the, <laughs> the telecom or something like that. Tur I forget what, the Turkish cell phone thing. And they had virtual reality. So I'm right next to Rumi's grave in the virtual reality headset. La la la. So, but if you will, think about this analogy. It will help us perhaps understand the nature of this world and wake us up to the nature of the world as a theoretical frame. And by the way, it's really important to understand. La ilaha illallah. Hasbunallah wa ni'mu And these machines are talking. <laughs> They don't like that we figured out we're, we're, we're cracking through the matrix, <laughs> inshallah. Alhamdulillah. So, to use this analogy, now, if you imagine, according to what our Prophet ﷺ is telling us, that our spirits were in the Divine Presence, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed that each one of us would leave the realm of the spirit and enter into this realm through the portal of our mother. Right? And we would be clothed in a specific body, and we would be sent to a specific tribe and a specific nation, and we would be given a certain set of whatever we're given to, f to play our role in this world, this dunya, this lower world. The dunya means the lower world. And if you think about this using virtual reality, it is as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave each one of us a virtual reality headset, like opened it, a box for you, directly for you. For me, Allah? Yes, for you. I gave it to you. And you put it on, your spirit put it on. And when you put it on, you, ent you witnessed the world. You entered into a virtual world. And in that world, you saw various things. You had various experiences. And, uh, and Allah was saying, essentially, Allah is saying, don't, rem don't forget that you're just a spirit entering into this realm, this isn't your true abode, and it's not even who you truly are. And you're only entering this world as a test for some hidden wisdom. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, essentially, I will send prophets into this world to awaken you, to remind you. And in fact, Allah also said that ev it's not just the prophets, it's everything in this world is to awaken you. That we will show you our ayat on the horizons and within yourselves until it becomes clear that Allah is al haq that Allah is the reality. al haq means the reality. <laughs> That this is a virtual reality, but it's all pointing at the reality. It's all pointing at the, the one who made the game. In fact, it is the one who made the game telling you about himself and trying to wake you up the whole time. Right? 
That's what ayat are. And so, of course, the prophets themselves are, <laughs> right? We've all seen matrix. It's like Neo in the matrix. I mean, subhanAllah. The, and don't think that the people that wrote these stories didn't understand sacred archetypes, didn't understand what they were doing. They're drawing on religious imagery. <laughs> Their understanding, right? And so this is the nature of this world. And what the whole point of dhikr, the whole point of reading the Quran, of reading these books, of coming to classes, of praying, of stepping in with your right foot and stepping out with your left foot, of saying Bismillah when you begin and eating with your right hand and saying Alhamdulillah when you finish and washing your hands before and after. And the, the, the dua for waking up and the dua for going to sleep and the, the adhkar for before this prayer and after that prayer. What is it? To be in a constant state of remembrance that you are in a world that you are not from and ultimately you have not even left the world that you're from. Because when you put on that virtual reality which sent you into this world that you're in now you have never left the Divine Presence. What is Ihsan? And ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarahu fa'in lam takun tarahu innahu yarak. Ihsan, what the Prophet ﷺ, which means, it's hard, it's impossible to translate actually, but we all know Ihsan. It is emphatic. Husn of husn. Ha, hasana. This means Yani, goodness, excellence, beauty, giving of oneself, magnanimity. And so it's the emphatic, the most excellent, the most beautiful. Doing beauty, ma making beauty. So what is it? To devote yourself to Allah as if you see Him. And if you do not see Him, He sees you. You, are, you have never left the Divine Presence and when people die, all that happens is <laughs> the goggles get switched off and you are in the Divine Presence. And you confront Haq, reality. And you remember. Then, if you don't remember now, you remember then, oh my God. I remember who I really was and why I was sent here. And if you lived in accordance with Haq, you rejoice. You rejoice, you witness Allah without a veil as you have before. And Allah said, and those who love to meet me, I love to meet them. And, but if you didn't, you are filled, and may Allah protect us from this, and everyone we love, and every being, we should not wish this on any being. If you take them off, and those people in the Quran that denied the prophets, and denied the reminders, and denied the ayat, they are overcome with a sense of grief and regret that is so profound that we cannot even imagine it. Because they know what they have done. They denied what they knew deepest inside. This is the definition of kufr. Kufr is to cover over. And it is ingratitude. Because, right, and that's why people say now, it's my life, it's my body, it's, my, it's not yours. It's not yours. It's Allah's. <laughs> and he told you, Shukr is doing with this gift what Allah told you to do. Kufr, ingratitude, is doing with it what you want to do, essentially. Or somebody else wants you to do. That's really the definition of kufr. Shukr, the definition of gratitude, is to use the gifts to get back to the one who gave them. <laughs> this is the affair. This is the affair. And may Allah forgive us and be gentle with us, inshallah, ameen. So this is really important because, and if you think about it, when we talk about the awliya, the prophets, 
Because also we talk about the ghaib wa shahada. This physical world is the shahada. It's what is seen. That's literally what shahada means, what is witnessed. But it means experienced sensor, sensorily, right? You witness it with your senses. But the ghaib is the unseen, is what is unseen. Most of the world is ghaib. This world that we see, the physical world, is just a sliver of it, right? And we don't have a problem with the scientific method, which says we observe this sliver of material world. Ghaib? You think other peoples didn't have science? You think the Chinese didn't have science? The Indians? The Islamic world? But we're, get, we're, we're opposed to scientism that says all you can know is what is observable through the sensory realm. No, that's epistemology. That's a metaphysical claim. You can't know that through science. May Allah give us hidayah. And so this is the affair. But if you think about the prophets and the awliya that Allah is describing, that start to be the eyes through which Allah sees, is that this virtual reality, to extend the analogy, you know, the back of the virtual reality, it's a screen, right? But what did the Prophet Sallallahu say? That everything has a polish, and the polish of the heart is dhikrullah, is remembrance of Allah. What does this mean? Do you, have you ever polished your mirror? Probably not. You might have cleaned it. But that's because it, we have different mirrors than they had in those times. In those times, mirrors would corrode, oxidize. If you have like an old mirror or even like old like silverware, you have to like, right, polish it. You have to polish it. They had to do that to mirrors back in those days. And if you don't do it, it corrodes and you won't be able to see. The Prophet is saying that if you don't make dhikr, if you don't remember, your heart covers over. What that means is you're no longer connected to your ruh. You're veiled. You're trapped in the sensory world. You're trapped. You're in a cage. You're enslaved to other than Allah. But the dhikr is then the polish. If you think of virtual reality, the back of the virtual reality, yani the screen, you polish it, it starts to become transparent. In other words, it becomes augmented reality, AR. You guys are tech people, you know more about this than me. I don't know this much, this stuff. People had to teach me about this. Augmented reality is like the Google glasses, where like you're seeing the world, but then you're also getting information like beamed into your iris, very strange, right? You, you know, like you're getting the directions like beamed into your iris. You guys know what I'm talking about or am I losing you? This is called augmented reality as opposed to virtual reality. Virtual reality is you're just in the world, you're in the box. Augmented reality is you're seeing the world, the real world, but you're also getting this information that you're seeing as you observe the world, as you go on driving or whatever. Yani. So the, the prophets and the awliya, for them, it's augmented reality. In other words, they're looking into the garden. <laughs> they're witnessing the ghaib. But they're also seeing yani, the illusion, the dunya. But they're seeing things as they truly are. As the Prophet said, O oh Allah, show us truth as truth and, and allow us to submit to it and follow it and show us falsehood as falsehood and keep us away from it. And what did Sayyidina Imam Ali said? He said, if the veil were removed, I would not increase in certainty at all. <laughs> you think the veil wasn't removed for Sayyidina Ali? And he said, never did I do some, anything except that I saw Allah before it, during it, and after it. La ilaha illallah. What does this mean? Saw Allah. He said, saw Allah. <laughs> okay. So, the whole point is, this is, it's one thing to understand this theoretically, and this is the domain of Iman. But as Iman deepens, it, it blossoms into Ihsan, where you're actually witnessing, you're actually experiencing the Divine Presence. And 
That's one of the beautiful things about our deen, our epistemology, as we've been saying. It's not saying just trust revelation. It's saying, like the scientific method, if you implement this, you do these actions and refrain from these actions. If you guard your heart from these thoughts and you fill it with these qualities, if you remove arrogance and you be humble, if you are selfless in service and devotion, if you are honest and not self-interested, etc., you will experience these realities. What? And this is the hadith nawafil. By these actions, you draw near, qurb, nearness. It's not in time and space. It's in your heart. And then you continue to draw near. Right? By extra acts of devotion. Hatta Until you experience divine mahabba, love. Divine love. And then the unveiling occurs. And Allah is the seeing through which you see. And the hearing through which you hear. And the hand through which you grasp. And the foot with which you walk. In other words, Islam is not an identity, it's a method. It's a method. Right now people say, I identify as a Muslim. Okay, you're either in submission or you're not. You're either surrendering to Allah or you're not. Muslim means one who surrenders their being to Allah. And we're, we're not claiming, the, I'll be the last to pretend, that I'm always in a state of perfect submission to Allah. La. But being a Muslim means you are committed in e each breath to strive towards that. To strive towards that. This is the affair. May Allah allow us to truly surrender. And as a brother and I were talking about yesterday, in the, as the poet said, <laughs> Bob Dylan, the poet, <laughs> now it may be the devil, or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. This is the affair. It, it, and the other poet said, one of the other poets said, you cannot escape slavery, but you can choose your master. You cannot escape slavery, but you can choose your master. Choose wisely. Choose wisely. If you are not a servant of Allah, you are a servant of a creature of Allah, or even worse, your own nafs, which is nothing but a creature of Allah. But Allah says, have you seen those who took their hawa, their fleeting vain desires, the caprice, as their ilah? They worshipped it. They, they prostrated to it. May Allah save us from these states and allow us to be connected to the people of beauty and truth and reality and of course the, one of the best ways to polish the mirror and to see things as they truly are is to keep company with the awliya to keep company with those who have attained these realities and if we can't be in their presence uh, always we are in their company when we read their books this is true they put their secrets in their books. Now Imam al-Haddad, an, we're not going to read his full biography. You can find this. And, and maybe some, uh, next week we'll say a little bit about this. But suffice it to say that Imam al-Haddad was one of these people. He was someone of basira. Inner vision. Inner vision. Now Imam al-Haddad... Uh, lived in the 11th century after the Hijra, which corresponds to the 16th uh, or the 17th century, um, our, our time, Yani, Miladi, as they say, after Sayyidina Isa, alayhi salam. And he was in southern Arabia, Hadramaut. He was a great scholar of the outward and inward. One thing that's important to know about him is that Allah took away his eyesight when he was four years old. And he was blind. Outwardly. But, Annie, what vision he had. And if one of us were to 
see things as he saw, like see what he saw, we would gladly trade our eyesight for what he saw. And that's not hyperbole. Because this world is the cave compared to what he saw. <laughs> it was out of the cave. This is the reality. May Allah allow us to see things as they truly are. He was a young man who was strange for young children. He didn't want to play. He just wanted to pray. <laughs> it's like a lot of the young awliya, they're like this. They say Abdul Qadir Jilani when he was a young boy. May Allah be pleased with him and connect us to him always. That in school, the, the lesson of the day was Zabiha, how to slaughter. How to slaughter. And so the, the teacher gave them all a live chicken. And told them to take it home and slaughter with their family. He said, take it away from people where no one can see you so you're not slaughtering in the street, Yanni. All this blood did. And slaughter. He taught them how. And then he asked them to do it. They all came back the next day with their slaughtered chickens. So young Abdul Qadir, he had his live chicken still. <laughs> right? They said, yeah, Abdul Qadir. His teacher said, yeah, Abdul Qadir, you didn't do your assignment. He said, Wallahi, I, I'm sorry that I, I couldn't do the assignment. He said, I really tried my hardest. I spent all yesterday traveling out of the city, wandering in the wilderness, looking for a place where nowhere could, no one could see me. But Allah could see me everywhere I went. <laughs> he was a little boy. So I couldn't complete the assignment. <laughs> La ilaha illallah. Imam Haddad was like that, to the point that his father was worried about him because he used to pray 200 rakat. After Doha prayer, when the sun rise. Little boy, 200 rakat. He's like, okay, maybe he should play a little bit. Like, I'm worried about him. <laughs> so he said, you know, maybe he thought it would like ground him spiritually if he studied fiqh. <laughs> now, now, like fathers, parents, and they, they want their, go, don't, don't pray so much, go fo get an you know, engineering degree or study medicine. His father's like, study fiqh. <laughs> study the sacred law. And so, Imam al-Haddad so fast not only mastered the books of the Shafi Madhab, but actually memorized them to the point where his father's like, okay, you're different. You can do whatever you want now. Like, <laughs> I, I won't interfere. And so he de devoted his life to, to teaching and to, to all these things. And he, they even say about him that people would see him and they would, they would hear these stories about him that he was miraculous. And he'd be, he would be walking like to the masjid late by himself or to Zenbel, the graveyard of the awliya there in Turim, in Hadramaut, by, without, without like a guide. And they're like, is he really blind? Like how does he, he's walking all these places by himself. And so they'd kind of like stay at a distance to watch. And then he would call them by name. He's like, yeah, Muhammad, I see you watching me. <laughs> and they're like, Ajib. And he, Basira. And uh, there are people that have that. Ilham, they have an inspiration. Prophet ﷺ said that, he said that amongst the Ummah there are people with mulhama that have this divine inspiration. It's not like wahi, which is for prophets only, but they have divine inspiration. He said that amongst them is, is Omar. <laughs> he said this amongst the Sahaba when Omar was present. MashaAllah, Sayyidina Omar radiallahu anh. So people have this, this insight, these inner visions, these awakenings. Naam. So Imam al-Haddad engaged in teaching the spiritual life. But something that's really important for our age to understand, he also was really engaged in the world. In fact, he did two things. One, he moved to the outskirts of Tarim, which was then like a yani, agricultural area, like well, you know, outside of the city. And he was engaged in agriculture. He was engaged in taking care of the homeless and orphans and all these type of things. He would write letters to the rulers admonishing them because he had a lot of respect and love from the people. So he was very engaged in the world. And our Prophet ﷺ said that every hundred years there will be a reviver, mujaddid. Which is really interesting if we reflect on this because the Prophet ﷺ said that every hundred years someone from the Ummah would come to revive Islam. Which is interesting because what does it mean that Islam needs to be revived every hundred years? I mean, we still pray how the Prophet prayed. We fast how the Prophet prayed, fasted. So what is it that needs to be revived? I mean, what gets lost, so to speak? Imam al-Ghazali, who is unanimously uh, called the reviver of the fifth Islamic century, 
يعني he argues and his whole life mission and his ihya ulum al-din is that what gets lost is the spiritual reality behind the form of Islam and so the revivers are people that are always affirming the outward and deeply rooted in the outward but calling people back to the inward and say the whole point of all of the outward is the inward and that was what he dedicated his life and so did Imam uh, al-Haddad who loved Imam al-Ghazali and one of the gifts of Imam al-Haddad is that he could say the most with the fewest words. Look, all his books are like this long, in translation, they're even shorter in Arabic. His books are very short, but they're comprehensive. And this is a prophetic quality. The Prophet ﷺ would never say in four words what he could say in three. This is eloquence. It's to not waste breath. And you'll find the people of Allah, they can say a lot in very few words. And in fact, you can study their few words for the rest of your life and it can affect you. And so Imam al-Haddad was like that. And he also knew that he was coming towards the end of time and that people were going to not read as much. And people were going to be more distracted. And people were going to need things summarized and simplified. He said that about his own work. And so he really summarizes what came before and so, just to close, before maybe we have a discussion, I'll talk about the five lives. Now, each of the five weeks that follow this is going to focus on one of these, and we're going to go deep. We won't read the whole chapter, and I encourage people, we have books, that they can get the books. If you register, you can get the book for much cheaper than uh, they sell it. Fons Vitae put this out, who are dear friends. Aisha Gray Henry, may Allah bless her. She's uh, one of my mothers. That's another story. But she's a very special woman. And um, she published this, and they, they gave us uh, uh, you know, a, a discount on this. So if you register, you can get it. In any case, the five lives are this. Um, the first life is life before conception. Alam al-arwah, the spiritual world. The second life is the dunya, the lower world this world, the one we're in. The third life is the barzakh, which means the liminal realm, or the intermediary realm, or the between world. This is the realm of the graves. But don't think that all you are is laying in your grave. No, this is a vast world. The barzakh is way more vast than this world. <laughs> we'll get to that, inshallah. The fourth life is the qiyama, is raising from the graves when the trumpet is blown. And all souls are called into the Divine Presence for the accounting. May Allah be gentle with us on that day. And the fifth life is what comes after that. The, these are the eternal abodes of the fire and the garden. The fire and the garden. And alhamdulillah, I can say this with a lot of confidence, being that I went through my phases with various religions before I became Muslim, including Eastern religions, Buddhism, Taoism, uh, including uh, Christianity, Catholicism, and uh, other traditions, that there is, no, there is no tradition on earth that has as much detail about what comes after death. This is a blessing. And we should know these things. Like, what else is there to know? <laughs> what, is it, what else is there to study? So may Allah allow us to reach these weeks and to uh, read not only read these words but to attain to these realities and that's the last thing that I really wanted to say is that it is one thing to theoretically know what we all know la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah there is no power or strength or might except by God. But don't we often think other people have strength? <laughs> don't we also often think, deluded, think we have strength or ability or we can do something? <laughs> right? Ma sha Allah who can wa ma lam yasha lam yakun, the Quran says. And Imam Haddad includes that in his, in his word al Latif. Whatever Allah wills is, and whatever Allah does not will, will not be. We know that, but yet, 
We worry a lot about what is, what isn't, what will be, what wasn't, what might happen. What if I don't do this? Right? Tawheed demands that nothing has power unless Allah allows it. Right? This is asbab. They're secondary causes. But we often think it's the fire that does the burning, isn't it? Don't we? <laughs> That's another lesson, inshallah. So the point here is that it's not about the theoretical abstraction. It's about the awakening Dhawq, yani tahqiq, realization of these things. That's the difference. Is to, that's what Imam Ali was saying when he said, if the veil was lifted, I would not increase in certainty at all. That's what the Prophet ﷺ was informing us in that hadith Qudsi when he said that Allah becomes the same with what you see. It's an experience. It's not a th theoretically, okay, I get it. Okay, that's fine. But it's not, it's about a realization. And this is what I believe personally, but also what I've heard from my teachers, is that this is what the revival, right, the Mujaddid is about, is calling us back to realize the deeper realities of our deed. Not just the surface, but actually to dive deep and to experience these realities for ourselves. And this is in our tradition. The sharia is the outward, what we follow. The tariqah is the inward purification. And what comes when you put those two together is haqiqah, reality. May Allah allow us to experience reality. Inshallah, ameen, ameen, ameen. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad miftahi babu rahmatillah. عدد ما في علم الله صلاة وسلام دائما بدوام مك الله وعلى آله ومن ولاه لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد يحيي ويميت وهو على كل شيء قدير Oh Allah, we ask that you bless us by your most beautiful names and by all of your prophets and all of your awliya and salihin and that you allow us to love you as you love to be loved to worship you as you love to be worshipped, to serve you as you love to be served, that you allow us to see truth is truth and to act upon it, to see falsehood is falsehood and to avoid it. Anything good in us, Ya Arhamar Rahimin, that you see, we ask that you increase us in it and anything that veils us and holds us back from our true potential of true ubudiyah to you, true servitude to you, we ask that you purify us of what veils us swiftly but gently, Ya Arhamar Rahimin. And bless this community. Allow us to be truly ummatan wasata, to embody this principle of wasatiya, of prophetic balance, of prophet prophetic justice and righteousness and uprightness, Ya Allah. And allow us to help each other draw near to you. And may we be companions in getting to you and returning to you, Ya Allah. And may this be a garden from the gardens of Jannah that people get a foretaste of your garden, Ya Arhamar Rahimeen. Bless our teachers, bless our guides, bless our elders, bless our parents, bless Imam Al-Haddad, and benefit us by him and through him, Ya Arhamar Rahimeen. O oh Allah, we ask that you make us instruments of your love and your mercy to all beings, and that you use us to serve you in a way that you love, and that you give us long lives of worship of you and turning to you and serving you, and that our last words in this life be La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Not only on our tongue, but in our hearts And in our spirits, and in this, our innermost secrets Ameen, Ameen, Ameen Ila hadratan nabi al-fatiha Ameen